And it looks like we've got Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Kate Seeley with the Middle East Institute. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, uh, examining uh, the current state of affairs uh, in Egypt with Sahar Aziz and Meret Mabrouk. Uh, they're here to try to help us understand uh, what's been unfolding uh, on Egypt's very uh, rocky transition uh, to what remains to be seen, inshallah, to democracy. Uh, needless to say, the um, stunning fall from power of Mohammed uh, Morsi this past month uh, has upended politics in Egypt and led to a new set of narratives with new uh, challenges. And we see on the one hand a democratic process uh, that has been halted, increased polarization, and uh, the threat of potentially more violence uh, in Egypt. Uh, on the other hand, we see millions of Egyptians who are very relieved uh, that there's no longer um, an Islamist president that they characterized as incompetent uh, running the country and that they were able to uh, take back their original revolution uh, of 2011. We also see billions of dollars flowing in from the Gulf to prop up the Egyptian economy, uh, a transitional government filled with cabinet ministers who are extremely accomplished, and some hope for economic relief. Uh, it's dizzying what has happened. We're going to try to make sense of it. And that's why we're gathered here today to really look at what lessons can be drawn from uh, the Morsi ouster, uh, to examine what are the implications of what has just happened for the future of Egypt and for the major political actors like the Brotherhood, like the military, uh, and like the, uh, and, and the liberals. And because we have a law professor here, we're also going to be looking at some of the legal challenges and ramifications. Um, I'm especially excited that we're able to have this conversation with two amazing women who know Egypt uh, intimately, who've spent a lot of time there, who've written very eloquently about the country. Uh, Marette was living in Egypt uh, until recently. Uh, Sahar was in Cairo during uh, the protests, and they both bring a unique set of uh, instincts and understanding uh, to this topic. Uh, allow me to introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. Uh, Meret Mabrouk recently joined the Atlantic Council's uh, Rafiq Hariri Center as Deputy Director for Regional Programs and formerly served as the Director of Communications for the Economic Research Forum in Cairo. She's also a non-resident scholar at uh, Brookings and is the founding publisher of the Daily Star Egypt, which was later renamed the Daily News Egypt, the country's only independent English language daily newspaper, among her many other accomplishments. Sahar Aziz is an associate professor of law at the Texas Wesleyan uh, University School of Law. Prior to that, she was an adjunct professor at the Georgetown Center uh, for Law, where she taught national security and civil rights law. Uh, she's also the president of the board of directors of IRLA, uh, the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association, and has worked in government and served as a senior policy advisor to the Department of Homeland uh, Security, where she worked on um, civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, there's more about both of our speakers in your handout. And I just want to say that they've joined us today as part of our new Arab Transitions Initiative to shine a spotlight on the transformations underway in the countries in transition like Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. As part of that, we're really spotlighting regional voices as well as regional an analysts. And uh, I want to draw your attention to our, our website, mei.edu. We're publishing a lot of this stuff. Hopefully you picked up some of our recent analysis. We've got uh, Jason Brownlee uh, analyzing Morsi's mistakes. We have a response from the Muslim Brotherhood spokesman Gihad Haddad. Uh, Lina Atalla went to see him in Rabal al Adawiya Square just a week ago. And we've got some interesting analysis about uh, this, the, the sort of state of women uh, in Egypt. In any case, check those out. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to have both of you here today for this important discussion, and I'd like to begin by inviting Mirette to the podium. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, okay, so I, I hope this thing works well because I, I tend to have a low voice, but anyway. So, um, as Kate said, I mean, I've, I've lived on off, I've, I've lived in, see, not enough. Okay, great. So I've, um, I've lived in Cairo um, 
on off since I started university a long time ago. Um, and I arrived, I mean, I, I, I arrived here on um, June 25th, and I just obviously picked the absolute worst time to leave Egypt. It's just bad timing. But. So, June 30th, um, now, what's happening now is not really a surprise, okay? I, I mean, people, I mean, keep saying, well, there was an ouster, there was a rabbi. It's not a surprise. This has been coming for a very, very long time. Now, President Morsi and the Brotherhood, and when we say, when we talk about power in Egypt, it is impossible to distinguish former President Morsi from um, his party, the Muslim Brotherhood. It's just, it's not, it's kind of a running joke in Egypt that the people running the country were actually Mohammed Badia, who was the supreme, um, uh, supreme guide of the Brotherhood, and um, his deputy, Khair al Shatr, a very bright man. Uh, yeah, not that Morsi is not bright, but they were the power behind the thing. So it is impossible to distinguish between the president and the party. All right. Um, the Brotherhood was significantly worried about June the 30th. Now, if, everyone, if anyone remembers back, they held a, a rather large rally in Cairo Stadium about 10 days before June 30th, maybe two weeks, where they attempted to uh, garner support for themselves. Now, unfortunately, most of the support that they had included um, the extreme uh, um, the, the extreme section of the uh, uh, of the Salafi movement, which is you know, saying something. I mean, we, but um, these were mostly jihadis. I mean, among them was Asim Abdel Megid. Asim Abdel Megid um, has spent about half of his life in prison, but, as has Morsi and Shatter. But unlike Morsi and Shatter, who spent time for being political prisoners, uh, Asim Abdel Megid. Um, has admitted to having the blood of over about 100 police officers on his hands. The, these people are seriously, seriously violent. And the rallies in, um, in the stadium two weeks before the, um, before the June 30th uh, uh, um, demonstrations were essentially to whip up support for um, a jihad in Syria. Um, Egypt doesn't do jihads. I mean, we don't. I mean, if, if, if you, you know, it's a funny thing to, to say if you look at Ayman al Zawahiri, but generally speaking, we don't, we don't really do jihads. But it was a good way to, to whip up support from, from, um, from these people. And, and then we, during the, the, uh, uh, the demonstration, we had Muhammad Abdul Maqsud, uh, who was a Salafi sheikh. Uh, essentially incite violence against Egyptian Shiites. Now, there aren't very many Egyptian Shiites, but they're Egyptian. And there are many people who feel that um, nationality depends on the passport that you're carrying, not what religion you're, you're practicing or, or what denomination of which religion you're practicing. Um, they did incite violence, and there were four Shiites killed several days afterwards in, 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 uh, in um, Upper Egypt. A horrible incident. So none of the events of June 30th were not a surprise. The extent of the events, I think, were a surprise. And you have to remember, these, these, these demonstrations were held um, mostly on the back of a petition by Tamarot. Many of you will already know this, so if I'm saying stuff that you already know, please bear with me because it's impossible to know who does know what, so my apologies. And it, you have to remember that um, tamarud, which is the Arabic word for rebel, um, their original claim was simply for new presidential elections. It was not for an all-out flip everything over, let's start fresh, but it was for new uh, presidential elections. Well, they got more than they bargained for. I think everyone got more than they bargained for. And then there has been this never-ending discussion in the West about whether this was a coup or a revolution. To Egyptians, I cannot tell you how irrelevant that question is. It's just, I, it's, it's completely irrelevant. Now, it's relevant to the United States, for example, because the, the US has a law on the books that controls uh, um, you know, giving funding to countries that have had military coups. So it, it is relevant to some people. It's not relevant to Egyptians. It just isn't. We're moving forward. Um, 
And what it is, I mean, in my opinion, was, yes, the army was involved. Yes, it was a coup, but it was a coup that would never, ever, ever have taken place without overwhelming public support. Now, you have to remember that when the army came out, I mean, when uh, the head of the army, uh, General Abdel Fattah Sisi, came out and told Morsi, I mean, gave Morsi an ultimatum, I have never heard of a coup that gives you a 48 hours heads up. Okay, generally speaking, you know, with a coup, you go in, flip things over, and you know, get on with it. But this was, I mean, they actually gave him 48 hours notice. The 48 hours notice, in my opinion, was just for show because they have been having this discussion with the president and with the Brotherhood for a very long time, for months. And the Brotherhood has been enormously intransigent. There was no reason for them to hang on to their prime minister, who to quote one uh, um, very well-known television act, uh, t television anchor, um, it, it said there are no two people in Egypt who will differ on his incompetence. It's, it's a dreadful thing to say about, about someone, but, and, and I honestly think that it's because the poor man just had both tie hands tied behind his back, but they refused to get rid of the prisoner. There have been an increasing number of uh, brotherhood, uh, 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 brotherhood members in government. And, and we have to point something out. Egypt has been going on and on about the Ikhwanization of um, the country, i.e. the formal introduction of brotherhood members in important roles, whether they are as ministers, whether, uh, more importantly, uh, in municipal councils and as governors. To be perfectly fair to the Brotherhood, uh, it must be understood that there were a lot of people who just refused to work with them. When the Brotherhood took power, they came up against, I, the Brotherhood thought that they would, I think, be able to swing into action because they have been operating effectively for 80 years. The thing is, the Egyptian bureaucracy as it stands now, the Egyptian state as it stands now, has been operating fairly inefficiently, but, you know, has been operating for well over 200 years. It's entrenched and uh, very difficult for an 80-year-old pipsqueak to just come in and, and impose its will on them. It just, it just doesn't, won't work. So, to be perfectly fair, there was a lot of resistance to the Brotherhood. They had a very, very difficult job on their hands. All right. Um, having said that, they were enormously inept. In fact, it's, I was astonished at how inept they were. They were incompetent. They made every single possible mistake it was possible to make during their time in power, and frankly, a few that never would have occurred to me. But, um, but you know, but the man was democratically elected. And this is, this is the issue. He was democratically elected. Now, I didn't vote for him, but he was, an, he was Egypt's first uh, um, civilian president. I, that, that counts for a great deal. Having said that, if they'd had any brains, he would have stepped down. He would have stepped down so that they would have been able to continue. He couldn't do that. They just refused to do that. They refused for him uh, to consider new presidential elections, they refused. It would have been, should have been easy for them to sacrifice the prime minister. He was irrelevant. Now, but then they said, uh, no, um, the president, the prime minister has to come from the ruling party. Now, the Brotherhood have always maintained that the former prime minister, Hashem Andil, is not a member of the Brotherhood. They have always maintained that he is independent, so for them to come out at the end and say, well, you know, he has to be a member of the Brotherhood is clumsy, but, uh, you know, the, but typical of their, their time in power. Um, and they should have replaced many of the members of the, um, the cabinet. It should have been easy. They just refused to do it. And I think they refused to do it because they underestimated the overwhelming uh, um, anger towards them and lack of support towards them. Now, the Brotherhood were elected when we had our first parliamentary elections in November 2011. The Brotherhood gained 43% of parliament. And they did that fairly. 
All right. Now, um, you have to remember that, first of all, they have superb organizational abilities. They have op been operating essentially as a proselytizing charity unit for eight decades. They have superb organizing abilities. They, and, they, and for eight years, they have been providing many of the grassroots community services that the government failed to. There's no reason why people shouldn't vote for them. They're trusted. They were doing a good job. You know, they, they, they were elected fairly, 43%. Now, with the presidency, that slipped completely. In the first round, um, Hamad Morsi's figures were, not, he just squeaked into the second round. He just squeaked. For quick comparison on the figures, you have to, if you take a look at Alexandria, which has traditionally been an Islamist stronghold, Hamad Morsi got about 14,000 votes in Alexandria. As compared to 600,000 votes by Hamdin Sabahi, who was the Nasserist candidate who unfortunately didn't make it. It's unfortunate that Egypt got the runoff between the two worst possible candidates. We got Mohammed Morsi from the Brotherhood, and we got Ahmed Shafi, who was not so much a holdover from the old regime as a standard bearer for the old regime. So we just had the worst possible choice. And whereas Mohamed Morsi had squeaked through with five and a half million in the first round, he managed to, to garner twelve and a half million in the second round, and those extra seven and a half million people voted for him just to keep Ahmed Shafi out. I have a long, long, long list of friends, acquaintances, people I know who hated the Brotherhood, but just hated the old regime more. And we, we got a bad lot. Although, in retrospect, of course, no one knows what would have happened because it's not that the other guy was any better. So, I mean, God knows. The, the, this, is, this is the lot that Egypt was stuck with, and it, it's paid for it. We've had an inept government. Uh, we've had a disastrous year and a half while they were in power, and people were tired. Egyptians have faced rising unemployment. It's currently at about... 13%, up from 9 before the revolution, and that's the official figure. Now, the official figure doesn't take into account the informal economy, and the informal economy, um, right, the informal economy makes up about 40% of the entire economy, so that's a heck of a lot of people un unemployed, more than half of whom are under 25. It's a bad mix. So, um, Egyptians were faced with rising unemployment, rising food prices, uh, constant power cuts, constant fuel shortages. I mean, you can, stay, you can sit in your car for five to six hours waiting to fill up your car. For people like taxi drivers, this is a nightmare. This is, this, is their, this is their livelihood. I mean, it's bad enough for everyone else, but for people who depend on their vehicles for traffic, taxi drivers, people who, you know, delivery people, all this, it's just, it's a nightmare. So Egyptians had had enough. And the Muslim Brotherhood was showing an increasingly amount of intransigence and greed during their power, and Egyptians had had enough. So June the 30th was not a surprise. The problem is the country has been polarized for a long time. It's been pro-Brotherhood, anti-Brotherhood. That balance tipped several months ago, and on June 30th, it just, I think, the apple cart just flipped over. There is an intense anti-brotherhood feeling in the country at the moment, and my worry is that no matter how inept and greedy someone is, it, it doesn't matter. The brotherhood are a large force to reckon with, and it, is, it would be disastrous for Egypt, I think, if they were not brought back into the political fold. The country has enough problems. Um, the polarization is bad for us, it's bad for, for any country, it's especially bad for a country that has had its foreign reserves uh, uh, tip to you know, just over 14 billion at the moment, um, not counting the, 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 the influx from you know, three, Arab three Gulf Arab countries. Um, we're in a very bad state economically and um, politically we are just the right side of chaotic. Now. At the moment, we have three forces online. We have the secular liberal parties who think that they're going to just pick up the ball and run with it. We have the Brotherhood who are digging in their heels and don't want to talk, but they're going to have to because the Brotherhood are all about survival. And they're not going to wiggle out of this one. 
they need to find a way to move forward and save face and save face with their own people. They cannot just tell the Muslim Brotherhood youth that, oh, it's okay, um, we're just going to forget about this and you know we'll, we'll go back to, to, to the drawing board. Especially since they did as they were asked, they went to the ballot boxes, they wanted the ballot boxes and now they're being told that just wasn't good enough. And then, of course, you have the Salafis, who, for my money, have just proved the smartest political operators. Uh, sorry, the Salafists are um, um, extreme fundamentalist Muslims, um, who have just proved the smartest political players on the field. They're super sharp. Now, they managed to be on the right side of June 30th because they, were, they thought the Brotherhood were as stupid as everyone else, but they have refused to take part in the government. Now, they have vetoed several appointments in the government. They've thrown their weight about successfully, but they've said the government should be technocratic and we're going to stay out of that. What that means is they're not going to shoulder any responsibility for any upcoming failures. That's relevant. So, Egypt is at a tricky and uncomfortable time. Um, I'm very worried about increased uh, um, increased violence. I'm very worried about the situation in the Sinai, where I mean we've already had one Brotherhood member essentially say that um, the, the the killings in the Sinai will stop if Morsi is reinstated, which is astonishing because you have a Brotherhood figure admitting to uh, uh, um, encouraging and funding terrorism. The, the, the Brotherhood have uh, I mean disavowed violence decades ago. But that's what they're doing. So um, the situation is fraught. It's hopeful. I think that we are on the right path. It's, it's horrible at the moment, but I, I am hopeful and I think that we will be, I think that we're on the right path. But it is a, it's a bad situation at the moment. Thank you. Saha, I'd like to invite you to the podium. Well, thank you very much to Kate for inviting me and for the Middle East Institute for hosting me. And it is really a pleasure for me to be speaking alongside Miret, who I consider an intellectual giant on these issues, as, as she just gave you an inkling of her um, expertise. Uh, so I wear multiple hats, um, and the hat that I will be officially wearing today will be my uh, independent law professor hat. Uh, I do serve as the president of the board of the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association, which is a very diverse group of Egyptian American lawyers who have uh, very differences, uh, differences of opinion, particularly on the issue that we're talking about today. So uh, the organization itself doesn't take a position, and um, what I say today is my personal views as a, as a professor. Okay, so what I want to focus on is getting into, she, uh, Marette gave a really great big picture analysis and I'd be happy to during Q&A tell you the anecdotes that I heard while I was there from mid-June until mid-July and um, just to assure everyone in the audience I had no idea this was going to happen because the, the timing is a bit suspicious right for me to be there at that time but um, I was one of those people who did not expect what ended up happening on July 3rd and I can explain to you more during the Q&A. But what I want to focus on today is really kind of the legalistic aspect. You know, what is all this brouhaha about? Why is everybody so upset at the Muslim Brotherhood? Um, in, a, in addition to you know, putting aside kind of the typical political wrangling that happens in any society, including ours, all you have to do is take a look at our dysfunctional Congress um, and their constant bucking heads with each other and with our president. And so there's nothing really new about that. That's politics. If you don't like it, get out of the business. But what was really at stake in terms of long-term rights and long-term structural issues, if, you were, if one was serious about transforming Egypt from an authoritarian system dominated by the executive branch into one that was um, more democratic, let's say, and democratic is a subjective term, and one that had branches that served as checks on each other, and one that had a civil society that was healthy and thriving and was willing to and had the space to be able to challenge authoritarianism wherever it may came, come from. So 
I, I want to focus on three main points or takeaways that I'd like you to, to just hold on to after I, um, as based on what I have to say today. And the first is that I think that among Morsi's many mistakes, and yes, he did make many mistakes as the first democratically elected president of Egypt, was his adoption of the same co-option of law tactics that were used by Mubarak. So it wasn't rule of law, it was rule by law. How can I use the law as the handmaiden of my political agenda? Which, as someone who's a, an attorney and a lawyer, that is an offense, right? To, I mean, my job and what I train my students is that you don't want that to happen in society, right? So for someone um, you know, who cares a lot about rule of law and legal reforms, that is a devastating um, mistake. Um, and it's one that is going to continue to be a problem for Egypt. So pay attention to it, whoever is in power. The second point is there were particular draft laws. Many of them didn't get passed. They got very close to passing but for July 3rd. And political maneuvers that occurred that I thought proved to be fatal in retaining his popularity. So putting aside kind of the structural opposition from the old regime, from the military, from the liberal opposition, but the actual people. Because I echo Marat's sentiment in that everybody I spoke to before July 3rd including those who had nothing to do with the protests, nothing to do with Tamarud, were very, very disappointed in his performance as a president and in the FNJ's performance. They thought that they had, as in terms of competency and performance, they had done an abysmal job. So if someone were to take an objective poll, I would place my bets, my best guess was his popularity in mid-June. If he's lucky, it would have been 25%, which would have really been the core brotherhood supporters, the diehards, his loyalists. But he had successfully, if, if to the extent he had 52% support based on the elections, which wasn't really true because remember there was a portion of people that flipped sides because he was less worse than Shafi, he, he lost them. And he lost some of his more, his, his own supporters, but, but for the diehards. So what is it that he did among the many things from a legal perspective? Let's focus on the law. So I thought, uh, I think that his, kind of the, the milestone, the quintessential moment, his death knell, from a rule of law perspective was the November 2012 presidential decree, constitutional declaration, where he essentially put himself above the law. He granted himself unilaterally the authorities of the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. It was a fatal mistake. It made it very easy to oppose him from, you know, he already had those who were going to oppose him and his party as a matter of politics. But even those who were willing to give him a chance said, okay, you now look like Mubarak with a political Islamist face or ideology. We didn't, do th we didn't go through this revolution for that purpose. And some could even argue that you know, if I had to choose between a secular dictatorship and a religious dictatorship, maybe I'd prefer the secular for, for reasons that I think are obvious, whatever the religion may be. So that's the, the, the first kind of the fatal mistake. Go back to November 2012, that's where I think things went really, really downhill. Um, and as a result of that, or, or part of that declaration was his granting of unilateral authority to fire the prosecutor general, Abdel Magid Mahmoud, who there was a consensus, if you took a poll on his popularity before he was fired, was probably 99% unpopular, despised, and hated. Okay, this was a person, and I, and I certainly don't want to engage in any kind of character assassination, but I think it was objectively understood that Abdel Magid Mahmoud was considered someone who had done a lot of dirty work as a prosecutor general on behalf of the NDP and the Mubarak regime. And um, he, was, he was not respected and he was not liked, and a lot of people, including the revolutionaries who went to the street and sacrificed their lives in the January 25th revolution, that one of the demands was to remove him. Okay, because he was the implementer of the authoritarian regime through criminal justice system. So he was not popular. However, when you unilaterally fire him and set a precedent when he's a member of the judiciary, which is a unique nuance of Egyptian legal system where the attorney general, equivalent of our attorney general, is a judge, a member of the judiciary not a member of the executive branch. So by firing him, what you've done is you've set a legal precedent that now the executive may be able to unilaterally fire all judges. If you care about judicial independence, that's highly problematic. So the issue then became not about him, but about this principle of judicial independence. So you just started a fight with a really big uh, player in the system, the judiciary. You don't want the judiciary 
um, as your opponent, in addition to your other opponents. Next thing he did was uh, the draft NGO law. So let's see, I can, let me piss off the judiciary, let me piss off the civil society. So you know, it's, it's almost as if they were had this list of all these people that could have been their allies, but it was almost kind of self-sabotage. Let me upset them, let me do exactly what they don't want. So they had a new NGO law that they were trying to push through, it got very close, but for July 3rd, that was going to suffocate uh, the NGO sector w and make it highly regulated by certain committees that were centralized and controlled by the executive branch. And their funds were going to be monitored, they were going to have to uh, produce annual and semi-annual reports, they were going to have to be subjected to uh, very mi micromanagement, which as you can imagine opens it up for politicization and it wouldn't be a coincidence that those groups who happen to be the most contrarian against the regime are going to be harassed the most, possibly closed, possibly um, criminalized. So that was, that triggered then a kind of figurative war with civil society, which I think one significant change, I, I wrote a piece on CNN called Six Lessons for Egypt, which kind of I would suggest you read only uh, part of it for my own self-promotion to be completely honest, but second because I think there's something there that you know, this is kind of my assessment in a nutshell. And one of the points I made is civil society is here to stay, formal or informal. The revolutionaries, however you define them, are here to stay. So be forewarned future leaders, including military. They aren't going anywhere. And they may be at best just a nuisance or at worst real political opposition in the system. But that has been, I think, a fundamental difference between January 2000 or February 11, 2011 and now. Okay, um, the other two more things, two more kind of legal mistakes they made is the a judicial authority law, which is the law that governs the judiciary. And they want, they had another draft, uh, was about to get passed. My understanding is Ahmed Mickey, who if you all recall was the head of the movement in 2005 of the Judges Club for judicial independence. He, I believe he got arrested and detained for a while. Uh, he was certainly not liked by Mubarak uh, and he was one of, he was leading the charge in 2005 that alleged that the elections were categorically fraudulent and that they needed to be um, and, and question the outcomes, which was very, very courageous and he paid a high price reputationally and, and just personally for it. So here is a man that was then appointed the Minister of Justice. Um, he was kind of along the lines of, you, he was not a, officially a Juan. I don't think he ever was, but he certainly was not one of those people who was um, against the Juan from the beginning. Um, so, but he was a very highly respected man. He resigned because of the judicial authority law. Because his object, his big cause was judicial independence. He was very committed to it, notwithstanding there's a lot of criticisms against him and everybody else who served in the cabinet. But Ahmed Mickey was really committed to judicial independence. And when he found that the Brotherhood and Morsi weren't going to compromise or they, weren't, they were going to produce a judicial authority law that was going to continue to co-opt the judiciary into executive, he resigned. And that then just continued the war. It was more ammunition that the judiciary could use. And then the election law, which kept getting kicked back by the Supreme Constitutional Court. The Supreme Constitutional Court dissolved the, dissolved the parliament in 2011, the People's Assembly, right before the presidential election. So Morsi came on as president without a parliament, not a very easy position to be in. They had uh, dissolved it based on the, their finding that the law was unconstitutional uh, because it allowed people and members of political parties to run for independent seats. And their remedy was dissolve the entire thing. There was a debate, should, have, should they have resolved the entire People's Assembly, dissolved it, or should they have just dissolved one third and had re-elections? That's a legal debate. Point is, it happened. So they kept trying to fix the law. They sent it back to the court. Now, for those lawyers in here, in the room, you might ask, why would the Supreme Constitutional Court have jurisdiction to review a court, that, a law that hasn't been enacted? That doesn't make any sense. That's a legislative matter. Usually, a court reviews a law ex post, after it's, it's passed, not ex ante. Well, part of the 2012 Constitution 
that was rammed through the referendum in December 2012 included uh, a provision that says that from now on the Supreme Constitutional Court only has ex ante review, not ex post review. Now, so you can, and that was political. I mean, I personally saw that and thought, what a big mistake. Why would you, that's not a good idea. You're bringing in the courts into the legislative process. You're going to politicize the courts. And no court can ever get it right perfectly. And if you, if let's say they do their best job to make it as constitutional as possible, you never know how a law is actually going to play out. And then it could turn out that there is a provision that's unconstitutional, but they can't go back and review it because they're prohibited by the Constitution from reviewing a law or constitutionality. It's completely counterintuitive. So that obviously didn't make the courts very happy either. So the court said, fine. Well, I mean, we, there's nothing we can do about it. So they just kept kicking back the election law. Some people thought, oh, they're doing this to be obstructionist. No, there were some issues. There were some serious issues. And they kicked it back twice. Um, but that was the reason why there still hadn't been parliamentary elections. And I can go into details about why, um, if I have time, or in the Q&A. So how much time do I have left? Just so. OK, so let me go back to, oh, I, and then I guess my third point, which is my uh, kind of, since we're in a, in a think tank, you always have to give your policy recommendations, um, which are completely irrelevant to law professors, but I shall feed the audience. So assuming the military is serious about ceding power to a civilian government, and assuming the liberals are going to figure out a way to bring the Brotherhood back into the political process, I agree with Marat, they you cannot write off 20 to 30 percent of the population. Or you can, but the consequence is very harmful to the entire country. But assuming that's going to happen, um, I think the keys to avoiding another political crisis in the future, which is really what we should be thinking about now. What's done is done, unfortunately, uh, but we've got to think ahead. So the first is this new, well, it's not a new constitution, the constitution that will be amended, the 2012 constitution that is now in the process of being amended, has got to, we need to focus on the balance of power between the executive, the judicial, and the legislative, with a focus on the executive, because historically the executive authority has been the problem. It's, it, the Constitution grants it um, for obvious reasons because Mubarak was able to control the parliament and the, and the executive branch, but he, every time he found a problem with the Constitution, he would just amend it so that he would grant himself more power. The election laws have to be structured and written in a way that they don't advantage a particular party or a particular political ideology and minimize the risk of the one vote, one time problem. And the one vote, one time could, doesn't have to be a brotherhood problem, okay? It can be any, any political party. Don't get obsessed with the brotherhood because there are a lot of people in Egypt that would love to be authoritarians. It is not, unfortunately, a one ideology problem. The third point is transparency. I can't say it ha enough times. And that is where I will put a plug in for Erla, um, where the Egyptian American Rule of Law Association, that's what we focus on, is a freedom of information law, transparency, transparency, transparency. You cannot fix something if you're in the dark. You can't fix something if you're functioning in the world of conspiracy theories, where there's no evidence, there's no facts. You need transparency. So you can hold people accountable. Because sometimes politicians do tell the truth, but if there's no transparency, you can't, they can't prove it, and then they'll continue to be um, disbelieved. And then finally, and this is more of a conceptual issue, somehow, this is, a very, this is the most difficult <coughs> recommendation, we have to figure out a way to convince Egyptians to play politics in a win-win situation rather than a zero-sum game. We've got to figure out how to get the country to figure to, to operate. Sometimes I'm going to win and sometimes I'm going to lose. And sometimes you'll win something and I'll win something and you'll lose something and I'll lose something. But this all or nothing game is dangerous and the stakes and the poor Egyptians are suffering for it. I mean, that's what's so sad. The, you know, the rich Egyptians, whatever political ideology they come from, they, they can buy themselves out of a lot of the problems. So very quickly, I will, um, I just want to make a few points to kind of elaborate on that. The first one about the Mubarak's regime co-optation of law, I wanted to give you guys some examples for those who are not familiar, because this is, these were the trigger points that caused civil society and the courts to be highly sensitized to some of the tactics of, of, of Morsi. First, you have the indefinite application of Egypt's emergency law. That got resolved thus far. Hopefully it won't be a problem. 
um, before Morsi got in to power, where the where the <coughs> military finally succumbed to pressures from civil society to end the state of emergency law, and the Constitution did place some restrictions. The use of special courts and military courts to try political opposition uh, and uh, parties and, and members as a circumvention around the civil judiciary. Election laws that de facto prohibited anyone that wasn't National Democratic Party from winning the parliament, at least significant seats in the parliament, and certainly not running for president. Control of the media. Usually the, there's regulatory bodies that are controlled by the Shure Council, which is not totally, but has a significant portion of it that is appointed by the president. And the Shure Council is a whole different issue of what's the point of the Shure Council, because historically they haven't had any legislative authority. But they've been used as a proxy to regulate media and other things. Um, packing the judiciary with law graduates from the police academy and the military academy, and changing the judicial authority law to make it where the president could appoint the head of the court of cassation, the head of the court, the Supreme Court, uh, constitutional court, so that once he got the heads in there, they would essentially discipline the rest of the judiciary so that if there was anybody that wasn't going to just kind of stay away from politics and kind of toe the line, they would get reprimanded through poor evaluations, lack of promotion, they wouldn't get seconded to these really fancy high paying jobs in the ministry or at embassies abroad. There were ways to discipline the judiciary. That's not to say that all judges are corrupt in Egypt, that's not to say that they're all politicized. But unfortunately Mubarak has successfully politicized, in my opinion, based on my discussions with a lot of lawyers and judges, the, the top. And then they would be the, the disciplinarians. Um, and I'm almost running out of time, so I will just focus on one thing before I conclude, and that is this constitutional declaration, because that's the one that I think was his death knell. It's seven articles, and here are the ones that are the most important. Um, the first is that he made all constitutional decrees um, final, any, that he made, and that the New People's Assembly um, that were final and binding and could not be appealed by any way or to any entity. So as long as that was in play, this constitutional declaration, anything he did within that time frame couldn't be repealed after it expired. Because he ended up succumbing to pressures and saying, fine, it expires as soon as the referendum occurs. Right? So the constitutional declaration that he issued was, in, in, in the, initially it was indefinite. And then he made a compromise and said, okay, as soon as we have a constitution, it doesn't apply, but everything I do in between is binding and not subject to appeal. It gave him the right to take all necessary actions and measures to protect the country and the goals of the revolution. You can imagine what that means. It prohibited the Judicial Assembly or any judges from dissolving the Shura Council or the Constituent Assembly. That was the assembly that was making, that was drafting the constitution that the liberals had, had um, uh, resigned from as, a, as a, a very large group. And it allowed the president to replace and appoint a new prosecutor general. And he ended up picking Talat Abdullah. And that, from the very beginning, caused him to have absolutely no legitimacy. People accused him of being essentially the brotherhood's version of Abdel Magid Mahmoud and created a whole new firestorm. So those were some of the um, those were some of the those were kind of the key issues of the declaration. I could go on, and I actually have a paper that I'll be writing that'll go into details uh, about that and the NGO law, the election law. But what you should just take away with is Morsi. Unfortunately for him and his party, and I think even for Egypt, because it would have been nice to have a democratically elected president to last four years, and it would have been nice to have another election that hopefully, probably, I mean, honestly, would have gotten rid of him because he didn't, he wasn't performing well. Uh, but he made it m much easier for what happened on July 30th to happen by co-opting law uh, into politics and using law to aggrandize his power and essentially be the Muslim Brotherhood version of the National Democratic Party. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madame Miret. Come join us <laughs> at the podium. Why don't you both uh, stand here? I think uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so I think I'll bundle questions. And uh, thank you both for the, that very interesting analysis and assessment of you know, why uh, Egyptians turned against Morsi. And I think 
Right, your points about inclusion of the Muslim Brotherhood are, are critical, how to find a face-saving way for them out, and, and your points are about uh, politics being not being a zero-sum game. Uh, that's the path that uh, hopefully Egypt will move toward. I'm not going to throw in any questions yet and allow the floor um, to ask, please, the, the lady in uh, white. And we'll take two, two, three questions at a time. So Thank you. you'll take your notes. Is this on? Yes. yes. Paulette Lee, uh, communications consultant. Thank you very much for your presentations. I don't feel I heard enough, though, about the military. Who runs the military? Who in the civil society said we all hate Morsi and what he's been doing, so Mr. Military person, kick him out? The military has called for a, a gathering tomorrow, Friday, right? Mm -hmm. Which sounds like an invitation to violence to me. More please on the military. Thank okay, you. so question on the military. Uh, individual over here. Hi. Um, I have a legal question actually. I'm Egyptian and I work uh, with the Hariri Institute for Middle East Policy. Uh, you talked about what happened in November, the presidential decree. And this is a very legal. To what extent you feel that the president, Mohammed, the previous president, Mohammed Morsi, lost his legitimacy as a president? when he did a coup against democracy, when he made, I, 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 <coughs> sorry, I see it as a coup against democracy. He has oath that he will respect the constitution, but he didn't. He uh, said promises that he will fulfill the, the, the aspirations and uh, the goals of the revolution, but he didn't. And, and instead of this, he put himself all over the, all the three authorities. So legally, uh, uh, to what extent he lost his legitimacy uh, as a president. Thank you. Marat, why don't you address the military question and then um, Sahar talk about the okay. legalistic. All right. Quick. Um, Egypt's military has kind of a funny position in, in society. It has done since, I think, Muhammad Ali pulled all the military together back about 200 years ago. Now, here's the thing. The military had a bash at running Egypt. Okay, after the last revolution, they said that they would be in there six months and they had to be booted out 18 months later. We did not have a good experience with them. So, and I think the military also realized that they were very, very happy, happy to rule but not to govern. They just didn't want to be out front, they didn't want to deal with any of this crap. They just, you know, were happy doing their thing. And in Egypt, the military has two main jobs. It protects our borders and it makes money. Generally in that order, okay? Generally in that order. Um, the military has vast economic concerns in Egypt. They build cars, they have pasta fields, they also own most of the non-privately owned land in the country. Now that, that goes back to the, the ooh, to, uh, to essentially uh, to Muhammad Ali's time, but in essence, the, the military owns most land that is not privately owned in the country. So they're a vast landowner. They have huge economic concerns, and their biggest concern is two things: a, the stability of the country; b, the stability of their own economic empire. The military has been in discussions with the opposition for months now, and there have been people calling for the military to come back, okay, in Egypt, four months, okay. In, uh, in Suez uh, um, and in Port Said, if you, uh, I mean, I, I have military conscripts telling me that they'd be walking the street and people would just be lobbing boxes of juice at them yeah, as, you know, as a present. They, they, they were vastly in support of the military after uh, various or other of uh, Hamad Morsi's missteps in, in, in Port Said. The, the, the Brotherhood was massively unpopular for various reasons. Rush, um, Sahar went through all the laws. Uh, the, you also want to take a look at the, the, the protest law and the, the labor law. The labor law was engineered so that um, to, to further throttle independent labor unions and, and the government run labor unions. Essentially, anyone over 60 would be removed and would be replaced by the Minister of Manpower, who just happened to be Brotherhood. Um, the protest law essentially made it impossible to hold anything other than a state-sanctioned protest law. So the military has been sort of being dragged back into this for a good five, six, seven months. And I think the military interfered because um, things in the country were getting bad enough that we were going to have a fairly 
we were going to have a big problem. That military doesn't like that. The military won't be able to protect its borders and it won't be able to make money. So the military agreed to be involved again. My take on it is that the military will allow people to get things back in order and then step back into the shadows where it can get on with doing what it does well. And a good indication of that is when CC gave the, the first declaration, he did not, they did not uh, cancel the constitution. They only suspended it. And that constitution was suspended it so that all we need to do is make some amendments. And those amendments, I, I am fairly confident that I can promise you that the amendments will leave all the privileges that the army had in, in the 2012 constitution, which is a bad constitution. They will leave all of their privileges untouched. The rest is of little relevance to the army. You guys can do what you want. I mean, really, you can run the country as you want, okay? As long as our privileges and rights, which include, by the way, military trials for civilians, I, I don't think that's going to come out, okay? As long as our privileges are untouched. So, yes, there were calls for the military to, to step forward and help. There have been for months and months and months. This, this was not a surprise. And this was not the military rising up and, and taking over the country. They, I'm sh pretty damn sure they would rather not have done that. But there have been overwhelming calls for them to do so, and there have been for four, five, six months. It's, this was not a surprise. None of this was a surprise. Okay. Sahar, on the uh, legality of the coup. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the military issue. There, are, there were certainly a number of people that I had spoken to in June who were so frustrated with the Brotherhood and so frustrated with the highly fractured and equally incompetent liberal opposition because uh, they had their problems too. They were very, very good at listing grievances but not so good at um, giving solutions or at least showing that they could implement you know, give feasible solutions that they could implement. But the point is, Egyptians were very frustrated, and so some of them uh, thought, well, let's go back to the military. That's our anchor, that's our stability in Egypt. You know, they, there's no other alternative, and they convinced themselves that the military would step back when it was time. Um, I uh, philosophically am against militaries running countries. I think it's a very, very bad idea. Uh, I'm concerned that uh, this is not unique to the Egyptian military, but any military may become a little too comfortable in power, as did the SCAF when it said, we'll only be here for six months, and then they said, oh, actually, it's going to take us about two more years, which is, and then the civil society said, whoa, two years, I don't think so, and it's already been a year. So I anticipate that may happen again. Uh, I hope it doesn't. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic when, I, I don't get comforted when militaries step in. Uh, but the point is there are a significant number of Egyptians who say maybe this is the best case we can get right now until we can move forward because there was such a, a stalemate. Um, now in terms of your legal question, so I think the, so, so the Brotherhood in some ways <laughs> Well, I, I can see someone saying, look, I don't understand why you're picking on us. We're doing what everybody else does. The SCAF issued constitutional declarations, and everybody got upset, but in the end, they were bound by it, and they made up some excuse. Because, you know, Morsi's explanation for the constitutional declaration was, I have to do this because I need to get my con a constitution passed, and I need to get a parliament so that I can get elections, and otherwise anything I do now is going to be by presidential decree, which doesn't give it any legitimacy, and I'm trapped. I've got the Supreme Constitutional Court that's dissolved my parliament, okay, that I've got this constituent assembly that's supposed to be drafting a constitution where they just continue to fight, they're completely dysfunctional, people keep resigning and protesting and saying, okay, we'll come back, and now, now we're going to leave, and he's got this deadline looming because um, it was structured in a way that he had six months to do it or else the whole process would have to start again. And it wasn't uncoincidental that when he issued this constitutional declaration at the end of November, December 2nd, the constitutional court was supposed to rule on whether or not the constituent assembly was legal. And had they ruled that it was illegal or unconstitutional, then he would have had to start the clock again. So his explanation was, 
what else am I supposed to do? I've got to do something. I'm the president. I can't just, the country needs a constitution. The country needs a parliament. The country needs to move on. I'm not saying I necessarily agree with that. I'm just giving you that's the perspective. And so every, you know, the road to hell is full of good intentions. So everybody has good intentions. Now, in terms of, and so I think that's the way they looked at it. Why would you say that I, um, in other words, I'm still a legitimate president. What I did wasn't that unusual. I how people would react. Right, and, and, and even legally, he thought, look, people have done it before, these are unusual times, which is the justification for everybody. These are unusual times. It's not a military coup, but even if it is, it's an unusual time. We had to dissolve the parliament, even though we could have dissolved one third. It's unusual times. So there's a, this is another problem of using law to co-opt it. Is it's, and it is unusual times, and it is revolutionary. But what I would respond is what I hope moving forward, the way to resolve this and to prevent this from happening again, is to have a solid impeachment law. And I'm actually having something will be coming out of, of, of me in the near future. Presidents screw up. They do. And they do things that warrant them being removed from power prematurely. It happens in every country. The key is you have to do it, or you should do it, I think, if, if you are focused on stability, which I maybe that's my genetic Egyptian makeup, is I, I do like stability, is do it through due process procedural mechanisms, give him his right, give him his right to respond and put forth the evidence. And I realize I'm being idealistic and assuming a functional legal system, I understand, but I'm saying if we're trying to move forward, Egypt does not have an adequate impeachment legal mechanism. So at the very least, we could we need that. That's as now how to implement it, enforce it, is a different conversation. Politics cannot continue to be contested on the streets. You know that's time and time and time again. Um, let's uh, get a few more questions. Individual here. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Some My name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm active. Uh, Egyptian here, uh, I realize uh, the thing happened, the coup happened, and the military control now. But how we can get Muslim Brotherhood to get over there when their leadership is arrested and their channels closed and all some some of them get killed and so on? H how we can do that? Yeah, yeah, and um, I would add to that if we could also talk a little bit about their calculations right now. They are in a corner, I guess, Mohammed Badia today uh, equated the coup uh, uh, against Morsi as a greater crime than the destruction of the Kaaba. So the sort of the rhetoric is, is being raised. <laughs> um, so how do you bring them down and, and get them to think about um, rejoining the political process when they have been you know, yeah. marginalized the way they have been? And, uh, last question from Phil. Um, I was interested, in Mirette, in what you said about the bureaucracy kind of doing this civil resistance, if you will. Um, and I'm sure you saw, I think it was the New York Times or other papers reported that the day after the coup, suddenly the police were back on the street and there were no more lines at gas stations and things like that. Now, mm -hmm. that may have been an exaggeration, but yes. I'm interested in this whole phenomenon of kind of the bureaucracy and, and the police not doing their jobs, making uh, Morsi's job that much more difficult and yet the people not blaming the police or not blaming the people who controlled the gasoline supplies but, but blaming the government for those shortages. I mean, there seems to have been kind of a civil disobedience there uh, by the bureaucracy. Okay. Who would like to take the Muslim Brotherhood question or would you both like to take, you take me um, the policy okay. side person. Let's take the Muslim Brotherhood question. Um, it's the million dollar question. Okay, and, and no one really knows how it's going to have done, but the thing is, they're going to have to negotiate. They have to negotiate, because if they don't, then they go back to being an outlawed organization, and Egypt goes back to the 1990s, where you had sporadic uh, terrorist attacks during the entire time, and it's disastrous for everybody. Uh, there was an arrest warrant issued for Mohammed Badia this morning, and in, in, I, I don't think over the last 80 years there has ever been an arrest of uh, a supreme guide of the Brotherhood. So th this would be uh, a big deal. Um, I honestly think that if they go to the, because the thing is this, they can always cut a deal and they can say, fine, you release our people 
and we sort things out. The problem is, and, and the, the, both the military and the interim government will be happy to do that. They will be happy to do that. But then the Brotherhood has to turn around and say to its members, especially to the Muslim Brother youth, we capitulate it. And there are a lot of, I, I'm not an expert on the Brotherhood, but there are a lot of people that I've spoken to who are experts on the Brotherhood who think that this would be really, really detrimental for the Brotherhood. So the problem is not that people don't want to speak to the Brotherhood at the moment. The problem is that the Brotherhood has to find a, a, a face-saving way out of this. It is, it is a really, really serious problem. It is, it is a very serious problem, but they have got, they have got to work with them and they have got to give them a face-saving way out. And that face-saving way, way out has got to be, that you may have to sacrifice a few of your members, it won't be the, it won't be the Supreme Guide. I, I, I would be astonished, okay? You may have to sacrifice a few of your members, but we will release the rest and you go back to being a charity organization until you manage to get your political act together. All right, um, they're going to have to give them away, and it's going to require a lot of work because the Brotherhood thinks that it can, at the moment, thinks that it can just continue to dig in its heels and make life very difficult, which is true. It can, and with every day that it does that, it loses more and, and more support. Passed right to them. It loses more support. So um, it is a very, very difficult question. I don't know that there is an easy way to answer on it, but. Everyone wants to talk. The army, I mean, the, the army sort of released this morning through a highly placed source. I mean, they didn't say who, but you know, that they would be happy to talk to anyone. The words they used was, we would be happy to find a reasonable way out of this. Of course, you know, reasonable depends on your definition, but everyone wants to find a way out of it. But the biggest problem is going to be for the Brotherhood, because it's easier to be magnanimous in victory. It's going to be very difficult for the Brotherhood to find a satisfactory way out of this. Very difficult. So, okay. any thoughts about the bureaucracy and sort of how it? Yeah, because I experienced it firsthand, uh, and it was a bit surreal, I must say. And I, I thought this must be what it was like to be in America in the early 1970s, and this must explain why everybody hated the Arabs, because. Um, I study a lot of, of Arab American history and, and it's a turning point when the Gulf cut off the oil and there were lines of people at gas stations in the United States. It is a very successful tactic to anger a population. So I was there and every day was getting worse and worse and I was, used, I needed to get around so I was a member of the public. and. Um, it was very difficult, very stressful. People, I had relatives who stood in line from 12 until 7 in the morning so that they could fill their tank up so that they could go to work. I had relatives who had to call their jobs saying, I can't, I just can't come to work. So the economy was slowing down. And as it got closer to June 30th, the lines got longer and longer. And we would wake up in the morning and just see our apartment surrounded by cars thinking, what in the world is going on? Are they having another protest in our neighborhood? Which is not usual. I didn't live in t near Tahrir Square. No, it was a line for two miles for the nearest gas station. So, and people were angry, very, very angry. Morsi didn't have an adequate explanation. He kept, he would say things like the supply line. Um, and when he tried to say, oh, this is the fulul, the loyalists, people didn't listen. Because one thing I noticed about people I spoke to was, look, he's the president. Fix it. I don't want to hear excuses. I don't want to hear conspiracy theories. I want my gas because I got to get to work. So he was left holding the bag as the president of Egypt. Now, the other side of that story is the New York Times articles was not exaggerated. I was there after. And, they all showed up the, the next day. it was miraculous. It was surreal. It just went from these miles and miles to, you know, you had maybe five cars in front of you. And I thought, oh, this is bizarre. So the, you, you didn't have to be an analyst or even understand the facts, that something very unusual had happened. Mm -hmm. Now, one explanation for it was that there's different explanations. And again, we're, we're living in the world of secrecy, so you, you, we don't have the transparency to know the truth. But one explanation was that either the old regime elements who controlled, who still controlled the distribution pipeline because it was privatized, were finding ways not to get gas to the gas stations. That was one. The second was, no, the gas was getting there, but there were these gas stations who were privately owned who were either politically loyal to the old system 
or were very upset that Mubarak was about to put in a new system where everybody was Morsi. going to get a card. Morsi, see, and now I think Mubarak Morsi, that's a yeah, Freudian yeah. flip, right? Uh, the, if the Morsi was going to give these cards, he was trying to fix the black market problem because people, um, gas stations were getting subsidized Russian. gas Russian. and then they were selling it at higher prices and not giving all of it to the people. And he was trying to clean that up by doing these cards, which was going to eliminate their ability to make this corrupt source of income, okay? So there were reasons for people not to want this to go through. So, so one explanation was they actually did have gas, but they, hoard, they, didn't, they told people we don't have gas. And then when July 3rd happened, ta-da, okay, we have gas. So something's got to explain it. It's a very bizarre phenomenon. Um, I, the police is the same thing. I, not to the ad extreme. I was there for three weeks, and having been to Egypt many times to visit, it, I always felt it was a police state, you know. I mean, I fortunately was never harassed, but I could see it, and I'd had relatives that were young men who fit the profile of the cops asking them, where are you going, what are you doing, just harassment. There wasn't a cop in sight. Traffic was a disaster, so there was no traffic cops, and there was no security cops. Egyptians were extremely stressed out about safety because there were a lot of carjackings, there were, um, high, they were uh, muggeries, uh, house break-ins, and Egyptians were not, at least Kyrians, were not used to a high level of crime. So you had this fear, and, and there was no police, so they felt completely on their own. Like, who's going to protect me if I get mugged? Who's going to protect me if somebody um, carjacks me? Nobody. Afterwards, I was like, oh my gosh, look at all these police everywhere. It was noticeable. To the extent that once I was driving at a place that was no way close to any protests and you had all these checkpoints again and people were just, oh, I just want to check your ID. Just want to. I was like, oh, this brings back some memories. So again, it, this is anecdotal, this is hearsay. I, I don't have the data to, to prove any theories, but something very, very suspicious certainly happened vis-a-vis -vis the gas and vis-a-vis -vis the police. Uh, one other thing, I'm going to let Marat get yeah. the last word in, is, is the military question, which Paula had left, and I forgot to mention this. Um, Sinai, Sinai, Sinai. Yeah. You want to talk about military when she talks about borders and economic interests? So the economic interests are the Masana al Makaruna. Mm. This is kind of a running joke. You know, these pasta factories they have, who yeah. would have thought? And Sinai. Yeah. Sinai is not in good shape right now, and it is not something that happened overnight. And um, one could argue, you know, the military blames Morsi for that. There was a lot of military arms that were being smuggled in yes. from Libya that was left over from NATO yes. that was military grade, no nonsense, shoot down F-16 stuff yeah. that was being imported into Sinai. The borders were certainly much laxer vis-a-vis -vis Gaza. Mm -hmm. And there were rumors of, this is hearsay again from people that I've talked to, that know military folks pretty well that there were people coming in from abroad that priorly had been forbidden from entering Egypt except yes. facing prosecution for terrorism yes. from Bosnia from Afghanistan from yes. Northwest Frontier they were coming back and they were regrouping and it was and you saw in the media you had you had soldiers that were getting killed you had soldiers that were getting abducted and used for ransom to release other prisoners Islamist you know prisoners yes. That's a really good way to upset the military and get the military to decide, yes. you know, maybe we need to take over. <laughs> so right I would just Sinai emphasize, yeah. Sinai, yeah, Sinai, yeah. Sinai. Yeah. Sinai. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, because we have to wrap up, do you want to make a yeah, final Yeah, two, point? very quickly. Yeah. The, the New York Times story was convenient. Um, having been in Cairo for a year and a half, this was um, the, the no petrol, sudden petrol, no pe we've been seeing this for a year. Okay, there is no petrol, you stand in line, you stand in line, and then you wake up in the morning and there's petrol. Now, you've got to remember that because Egypt's foreign reserves have been plummeting, we've been unable to buy petrol. A lot of, I mean, we have petrol companies, BP, I think, for one, just shut down and said, sorry, we're just not selling you any more of this stuff. So we really haven't had the petrol. Um, we have had a problem, of course, with people hoarding uh, petrol and then selling it on the black market. This was fine. After July 3rd, it would have been tricky to attempt to do that because it was likely that any petrol owner uh, discovered how to do that it would probably be taken out summarily shot, uh, possibly by one of the people who had been standing for eight hours in line to get the petrol. Uh, and, I, and no one would have blamed them. 
So um, there is no doubt that the institutions consistently stepped on Mohammed Morsi's toes during his time in office. No doubt. Okay? There is no doubt that his life would have been made so much easier out in the countries if the institutions had played ball. The thing is, the Muslim Brotherhood, in the same way that they upset the military, in the same way that they upset the police, also upset the institution by attempting to shove in some of, a, a great many of their completely inexperienced cadres into positions of lying. So they, they pissed everybody off. Yeah. It's not possible, they just pissed everyone off. As for the police, the police didn't have a particularly illustrious role during Mubarak's time. They really took it in the neck after the first revolution and they said, fine, run the country without us. And then uh, the Brotherhood didn't make life any easier. They just turned a blind eye to policemen being killed. We've had 243, I think it was at last count, policemen killed on the job in the last 14 months. You never hear a word about them. He wasn't popular with the police. So, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation, but we are out of time. So please join me in thanking Mirat and Sahar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your very first presentation in Washington since you've been back. Many. Mabrook. <laughs>